Hello everyone, uh, friends of the internet. Uh, my name is Austin from Austin B Media, and I have uh, Jamie Adams from She Is Love. It's opening February 3rd, I believe, digitally. Um, and it's got Haley Bennett, who you might know from Cyrano. It's got Sam Riley from a bunch of movies, and it's got um, Marissa Abella, who is re recently, um, she's got the Amy Winehouse movie she's shooting right now, actually, as we're talking. For those who don't know about the film, Haley Bennett's character, Patricia, travels to this place for work, and all the places she needed to go are booked, so she ends up staying at this little cottage place. Her ex, I believe his name Idris, her ex-husband Idris, who manages the place with his girlfriend, Louise, who's played by Marissa Abella, and as one can imagine with any romantic drama, things go a little haywire from there. Yeah, absolutely. Very uh, well summed up, Austin. That was wonderful. Yeah, no problem. Uh, I just got done watching it, gosh, about 30 minutes ago. And I have a ton of questions. <laughs> um, a t just a ton. That's fine. So first, this is kind of a unique idea, you know, this kind of isolation not comedy, but it's set over three or four days. So where did you come up with the idea for She Is Love? Uh, I've had it for a while. Also, I just want to say from the, from the top that we, we will be in select theatres, which is a wonderful thing. So thank you to our distributors for that. Um, but yes, it, it's an idea I've had for many years now. I've, I, I have a draw of ideas um, and we were going through the pandemic and I basically was just searching through desperate to get back out and safely you know create create a movie so it she is love seemed to lend itself to the environment that we were that we were in in terms of minimal cast generally one location a few locations in general so yeah so it was it was it was something that seemed to to naturally be calling out to be to be made at that point in terms of how it develops, in terms of where it, it goes from there, I, I use improvisation. It's an Im improv-led movie. And so I have the story outline, and then I send that out to Joy being in the film. And Haley and Sam were, and Marissa were first choices, really. And I was very, yeah, just incredibly fortunate that they were into the idea. And then we have improvisations through rehearsal, and then that leads us to character development and and we follow the characters through the shoot. Uh, they kind of present to us the emotions and the arcs and so on and as, as to what we follow, and I guide it through, and that's it. That's She Is Love. You talked a little bit earlier about it being, well, you say multiple locations, but most of it's in this house, right? Tristillian House. So apparently, I was looking this up before our interview, and apparently that place has a lot of history. Funnily enough, uh, my note while watching it was, have you seen the uh, romantic comedy Wild Mountain Time? Yes. That came out a couple of years ago. Yeah. I was like, I wrote, I wrote down the note was like, was this the same house they did Wild Mountain Time in? Because I, I saw like a, a establishing exterior shot mm -hmm. and I was like, wait a minute. Is this the same house? Is um, it the same house? I don't think it is. I <laughs> went to... There's a big I, setup then, Austin. <laughs> I wish it was, because it looks exactly the same. It's an historic location, apparently. What was it like filming there? Did you have to get special clearances? Did you have to do any modifications on set? Again, Tresillian House presented itself in terms of we were looking to shoot in, in West Wales. I'm, I'm Welsh. Uh, Cornwall is part of Celtic sort of heritage so I've lived there for at some point as well so both places feel home to me and that was important for this story because it's quite personal to me in terms of the West Wales location it didn't it didn't afford us as many opportunities as we were looking for from a location it needed to have lots of although it feels like it, it, the film takes place a lot within the rooms within the house there's actually quite a lot involved in terms of the the sort of exterior of the house and the, the gardens and tennis court and so on. There's there's lots of different things that were presenting themselves. And and in fact, the, the, with Tradillion House as well, there's quite a lot of pathways, but they don't actually lead anywhere. They just kind of like get to a pond or they get to a greenhouse. They don't really lead out. 
And I think that that, you know, just immediately made me think this was the right place for Patricia to be turning up to because her work trip, this trip in particular, has led her down a, a path to her past and doesn't want to let her go until she's been able to at least approach the past and try and find some reconciliation. So it, it, it all kind of became a part of the the atmosphere of the film and the characters themselves and their own narratives. We were very fortunate with Trasilian. It is very historic and it's full of ghosts. And again, that's part of the spirit of the film is the ghosts of our past and so on. So, yeah, it worked well. Something I noticed is these characters feel very lived in, almost like you maybe had a friend who was like Louise, a friend who was like Idris, ideas from these characters for these characters and did you base these characters on somebody you knew i think with film or any storytelling and this is why i'm glad as well that i don't solely write these these my films they they come they emerge through collaboration so there it's it begins with my perspective my my version of this story which i draw upon my own life and and of course we draw upon our friends and families and whoever that we we you know the experiences that we've had through our lives. But then what happens is that as soon as I start having discussions with the key cast, their own lives and experiences feed into our story. And then it's my job to, when I create the scriptment, essentially as a script without dialogue, then, yeah, I make sure that I weave into that the the kind of, what I found the most interesting elements of the stories that we would talk about in in pre-production in in rehearsal. So yeah, so they are of course they're based on on people that we that we collectively have met and experiences that we may have had or other people may have had. But I think the main thing for me was that it they felt like universal stories and and you know we've all had that love of our life that that we didn't particularly potentially know at the time that they were or feel frustrated that we were too young to deal with the the strong emotions and and you know moments that happen within that first love when we are in our 20s and perhaps when we're in our 30s and 40s we might have been able to deal with a little bit better and maybe even still be together so yeah it's 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 all based on truth in some way I I just found it interesting the way the characters interact with one another, especially, I don't know if this is giving spoilers away. Um, It's a fairly minor thing. Idris's DJ persona, I found kind of interesting because that feels so, when you meet, it just feels so out of left field. I'm like, wait, whoa, he's got a DJ persona called Loverboy. Because it's very important to me and Sam, uh, Sam Riley, uh, when we were talking about Idris and the fact that uh, essentially it's the idea that when we're younger, we're much more confident in in the ability to. Suppose when you're in a relationship, when you're young, it would breed so much confidence that his character would have been a great musician and songwriter at that time and and expressed himself much more fully than when the relationship came to an end and they would have started to shut themselves off, but they still would have wanted to be in a creative space of some sorts, just me, may, but maybe not one that's so exposing. And so the love of music and the idea that you would then turn to DJing just felt natural. And it's something that both Sam and I have actually done in our own lives is turn to DJing at some point or other. The problem that's happened for Idris is, the problem that happens for DJs in general is that people expect a certain set from you. So the, the creativity involved becomes less and less. And so, and, and so, yeah, so when Patricia turns up, you know, in his life again, it's kind of almost at the right moment for him to go back into feeling more able to express himself fully moving forward. So, yeah, so I, I just love the idea of a DJ. I just love the idea that, you know, you're playing other people's music as a creative endeavor it's like it's it's obviously is a creative thing to do but it's very defensive point to start from you're not really you're not expressing you know there's that there's loads of different ways of djing as well so there's probably djs that might listen to it and go hold on it's very creative you are giving yourself you're expressing a lot of yourself but most of the time i feel like it's very minimal 
the getting to know somebody through through DJ. <laughs> so yeah, so it was that idea that he's hiding in some way. Yeah, I hear a lot of people say when they DJ, they're just like that some people just expect expect me to turn on like party mode on Spotify or, or something like that. But you actually just brought up an interesting parallel, which between the two characters, um, Idris and I forget the lead's name. Patricia. But Patricia, Patricia, where they're both creative people who want to be creative, but al- almost feel kind of stifled by their situations. In fact, it's a whole house of creatives, which I thought was interesting because mm-hmm. you have the scene of Louise talking to i think it's the groundskeeper Mm -hmm. about this one line where she's like i guess breaking up with somebody and she's she's and she's like i thought something about monday and she just keeps saying it over and over and over again and the groundskeeper's like hey i gotta work could you just not do this (laughs) right now because i've gotta take care of the books can you just do it by yourself and she just kind of snaps like no, well, but it would be more helpful if you do it. And she's like, "Well, okay." <laughs> yeah, no, there's, there's, a, that's, that's it. It is. It was, you know, it's all engineered that way. That the idea of a house of who would be attracted to who and for what reason and so on. A house of creative. It was always going to end in some kind of. I think creatives are much more vulnerable people, and generally have the right circumstance they're able to be more open and honest and I think that was the interesting idea that these aren't people that shy away from giving everything to a moment you know creative people generally are willing to be in the moment and to give you their everything no matter what that means for them so that's yeah I, I think that's it but also they're isolated within their own endeavors and in fact the thing that's interesting about Idris turning to DJing and then we discovered with Haley through conversation that that Patricia would have moved away from writing her own novels into publishing as a much more functional formal thing to be doing to but yet still somehow has something to do with um what she really passionately would like to be doing yeah they're hiding you know the, the whole isolation thing is there in all aspects of of the film, I think the only one who isn't hiding is Louise, and I think that she's always very much aware of why, where, why she is with Idris. You know why she's there, why what's going on. She's never threatened. Well, initially, especially ne- not threatened at all by Patricia turning up. Just a bit confused as to why and what it means for Idris in terms of you know how involved he was or is in that. So yeah, so I hope. Yeah, I hope it all leads to original setup, really. I think it does. And there's a moment where she kind of just gives a smile and it's like, oh, that's kind of refreshing from Louise. Right. Because of what happens during the film, which I won't which I won't spoil for those who ha- haven't seen it at EFI. I think it's where you guys premiered. Or, or no, I'm sorry. I'm thinking of another film. Sorry, got my wires crossed. But yeah, it it feels so natural, and I think, I I think there is a tendency where, with romantic dramas like this, or even I think at some point you can even call it a romantic comedy in some aspects. I call it an existence comedy. Apparently, but yeah, it, apparently that's not a genre. Apparently, that's something I've made up. That's what I would. <laughs> that's how I would describe it. I will not, with how many genres there are today, I would not be surprised if that is a genre. Because if you start going into thrillers, it's like there's psychosexual thrillers, there's psycho, uh, a bunch. Uh, I I forget what, oh, they, they're calling a lot of horror movies these days elevated horror. And I'm like, yes, okay, I, that's not really a genre, but it kind of is. But What does it mean? What does it mean? I don't know. No, I would I would say I I'd say it's a, I hate the word dramedy, so I'd rather just say yeah, it's a it's a I don't know what to say. It's it's a it's a romantic drama with comedic elements. 
Yeah, I think that's a pretty good summation of it. S something that's, that was curious to me, uh, besides the story, you've got some pretty heavy hitters in the cast. Like I mentioned mm -hmm. at the top of it, thanks. You've got Haley Bennett, who just came off of Cyrano, I believe, when you filmed this. Mm -hmm. um, Sam Riley and Marissa Abella. Maybe you've mentioned this prior, but how did how did they find out about She Is Love? Can you, you just, can you just talk a bit, bit about the pro, uh, casting process? No, uh, ever since I started making my independent improv movies this way, which is about 10 years ago now, I always get asked about, do we always attract incredible cast? I mean, we've had Kobe Smulders, Jemima Kirk, Jennifer Grey, Griffin Dunn, Alia Shawkar, Aza Gonzalez. I mean, the list just and you know they want to they want to be involved in something that feels original and 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 gives them an opportunity to flex muscles they wouldn't necessarily perhaps you know to to kind of work within their craft to be able to push the boundaries a bit and yeah we're, we're very very lucky with 2007 I saw Sam Riley in Control which was you know epic performance absolutely and it was the same year I saw Haley Bennett in Music and Lyrics, the Drew Barrymore and Hugh Grant movie, where she played a pop star. And I actually thought she was a pop star because she was that convincing. And then my, my leads in this film, it just feels like it's been, I mean, they're, they're my, my two favourite films from that year. It just feels kind of like, you know, it was written in the stars that this was going to going to happen so if it, yeah it, it, i believe in fate i believe in all of that and there's a magic trick to it you 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 you're passionate about the story you make sure that you express that passion to whichever actors you're thinking of in however way you can normally that is through um their teams there are other ways of, of reaching out nowadays in terms of the internet and apps and so on I love how old I sounded then as well, which is fantastic. Uh, reach <laughs> out, you say, you say everything you possibly, you know, be as passionate in the expression of that. And then if you're, if you're an honest, you know, if, 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 if you just, if there's no nonsense, if no, no, what's the word? If you're just telling the truth about what it is that you want to do and the way in which you're going to do it, people respond to that. There's no element of trying to impress them in any way. You're just being you and you're just expressing what it is that you want to do. And yeah, if they're and then they seem to get excited about this kind of way of working, you know. You want to hear something funny? Go. Maybe it's funny. I don't know if it is, but sometimes I will. During this movie, I was I occasionally was like, I don't know why, but um, I, oh gosh, there's this French actress I confuse Haley Bennett for all the time. I think it's Leah Sadu. I confuse her okay. for all the time. And then um, with Sam Riley's voice, I kept hearing Davy Jones from Pirates of the Caribbean, the guy who plays him. Uh, Bill yeah, Knight, yeah, yeah. Uh, who, who actually, I think, just got nominated for an Oscar. He did indeed. And a little secret there, Bill Knight and Sam Riley are very, very good friends. Oh, maybe they exchange tips on like, here's how I do the Davy Jones voice. And <laughs> here's how you can this use is how it. you want to speak. This is generally how you should be speaking in life. And yeah, that's probably it. Uh, but Jamie, I want to thank you so much for taking uh, your uh, busy day to sit down with me, albeit virtually. It's yeah. still crazy that virtual interviews are still happening and a thing. But I wish you all the best. I wish people see this either in theaters or digitally, whatever is comfortable for you, those watching at home. Thanks so much. And thank you for taking the time and really appreciate the questions, Austin. Yeah, no problem. Mm -hmm.